Welcome again to our second part of uh, the, in this case, panel discussion with a very interesting guest. Our topic is how are German key industries digitizing? Uh, and our guests are Christian Pichnik, co-founder of Wandelbots, a rising star in the field of robotics. Wandelbots teaches uh, robots how to behave and interact and move. Um, and uh, we will find out more about your business model in a little bit. Janina Kugel, right next to him. Uh, she's not only Chief Human Resource Officer and member of the Managing Board of Siemens, she's also, and we are very proud of that, member of the Advisory Board of the Digital Hub Initiative. And I think she's here for uh, giving us the corporate perspective on uh, this topic. And Jens Philipp Klein, hi. Uh, he's managing partner at Atlantic Labs, uh, VC focusing on transformative uh, technologies um, with start startups like AI Park or uh, German Bionic. And of course, we're going to ask him why they invested also in Wandelbots, for example. And uh, to complete our round, Miriam Schröder. She's a startup reporter at the Handelsblatt. Uh, she has a very cl close eyes on the digitalization and the ecosystems. And normally she asks the questions today. We want to get her <laughs> opinion on our topic. Uh, to start uh, with a little bit a broader view of uh, digitization in Germany, we want to look outside Germany. So Janina, um, Siemens is a like, huge company with um, acti active in like, so many places in the world. Can you say in comparison to other countries, is there a German digitalization or way of digitalization? Um, well, I think, and that's what's always discussed, is Germany is not exactly the fastest, the most risk-taking, not exactly, I mean, always taking a lot of rules into consideration. And so if you want to stereotype it, then I would say that's, that's Germany, right? Mm -hmm. But then on the other hand, um, you know, what, what Germany has all been famous for, like engineering made in Germany, 100% secure and all of that, that's also part of the truth. But what I would see is that really the world is merging and also our people do. Right, so it's not that I would say the German team, like you know, researching on AI is totally different. But sometimes the frameworks are different, and sometimes the approaches are. But if you bring everything together, I always like think you can get the best out of the world, and that's what we can do, mm -hmm. as we are really globally represented. Yeah. You said already get best uh, out of both wor both worlds. So now we we had the startup, uh, the corporate perspective on that. What do the startups say about that? What can for example, Christian Wandelbots contribute to the digitalization in Germany? Yeah, of course. Um, so basically what we do is developing a product for uh, teaching robots in industrial manufacturing by end users. And of course, uh, basically we're providing a product which in any sense does not exist today. So, um, and when you, when you talk about German digitization in contrast to, to other countries, of course, there are big, big differences. And I would agree that, yes, some, some sense of conservative behavior is always there, but it really, really depends on the type of people you're talking to and uh, also yeah, the culture within the company. So even within like large corporates, you can find units or people that are really eager and fast. But in general, I would say, especially working in Asia. So we have an office in China, for example, is completely different pace. Mm -hmm. And um, what would you say uh, can tech startups in general contribute to make the big corporates more digital? Yes, uh, I think um, there are so many technologies available today, which when you apply them and put the puzzle pieces together, can, can create a real big impact, which um, basically is up to creativity and, and, mm -hmm. and, and speed and um, try and error. Mm -hmm. um, basically, I, I would agree in general, you, it, it's harder to do that in, in larger corporates. So having, having even, even if you separate like small units, which can r work rather independent, you still are kind of caught in this big corporate structure. And, mm -hmm. and in, in Germany, especially where this, this sense of, of conservatism and, and fear for making, making mistakes is mm -hmm. kind of hindering people to accelerate. Mm -hmm. And therefore, of course, startups bring this kind of speed and fast you need to do that. Yeah. 
But, but, but if sure. I may add, so I think it's like, and we were speaking about that behind stages, that if you can bring things together, so for example, startups maybe have a great idea, but we can prototype it then in production, right? Mm -hmm. And that's, and, and so I definitely think we can learn from each other and definitely can corporate learns from startups, oh, absolutely. Mm -hmm. And I think when we always speak about ecosystem, we have to get out of that mind of like, we could do things alone. Mm -hmm. I mean, even if you're large and big, that doesn't mean that we can do things alone because they are much faster. And on the other hand, they need scale. So I think that's what you always have to bring together. Yeah. So we're actually already talking about networking. Uh, Jens, I, I want to ask you, uh, what is the role of the VC in this whole setup? So you, you said on your website you're providing not only with money and tools, but al also with uh, an, a big network. Yeah. Um, how can the VC contribute to uh, a collaboration between startups and corporates? Okay, I think first of all, I think it's important to mention we're um, early stage investors. That means we are usually the first um, money to, uh, uh, you know, or be the first provider of money into a, into a company. Uh, just to give you, you know, one example with Vandelbot. So they were just uh, five founders in a, still at university, um, and the, the company was not even incorporated. So uh, our role is to take in this at this stage a lot of risk obviously mm -hmm. um, um, invest um, a, a, an amount which basically enables the company to get started and which also enables the company to succeed and, and show the first results uh, um, most of the case it's a proof of concept or a you know product market fit in order to attract the next uh, next financing round basically and I think that's also when you think about the uh, collaboration between startups and corporates, probably the biggest misunderstanding is uh, how clocks tick, because they clock, they tick at different speeds. Mm. A, a, an average startup has a lifetime of um, 12 to 18 months until it has to raise the next round of financing. And this time it really has to you know, get customers, get projects going, ideally get revenue. And, and what we see with corporates is, you know, they simply often have more time, mm -hmm. um, and this sometimes collides. Um, um, and, yes. and can that work the other way around, Janina? Can, can uh, the startups make the corporates faster then? In some areas, right? And I think that's what Christian said. Just, I mean, those, I mean, it's very clear. Either we're, we're quick enough or they go somewhere else. Mm -hmm. That's always a question, whom do they need? So I would actually say, and, and, and that's always what I think is a disadvantage sometimes of Siemens, we have pretty much like everything. We can be very slow in some areas, and we are, and we can be super speedy and super innovative where people are coming in there from the outside and said, oh, I never thought that Siemens people could actually do that. Mm -hmm. So I think is people also adapt, and we know if we're not fast enough, we're out of the market. So yes, we can as well. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But m maybe a short story to that. Um, <laughs> but a nice so one, please, right? No. <laughs> so, so there was the manager, or two people of the management board of a big, big German corporate. I will not say name is well, wasn't Siemens. But so, but <laughs> um, we're we're visiting our office, and they they said, okay, that's very promising technology. They had a look and, and said, okay, we start right away. So we come back with our team in three months. Mm -hmm. So this was right away, right? And, and one week later, I was sitting in, in, a, in a similar meeting in China. Mm -hmm. And uh, the, 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 they said, we will start right away with, with discussing a pilot. And right away me meant that after the meeting, four people were staying in the room, like discussing the pilot. And this was this where I understood the different kinds of notions of right away. Yeah. Yeah. Is there any format you have in mind? Um, that enables corporates to be faster? So is there anything from your practice and your experience that is um, one thing that maybe is interesting for our audience to adapt? So I think the people in general can do that, but it's pretty much up to the, the, to the, to the culture in that corporate and also the, um, how, how um, easy it is or how, how allowed it is to, mm. to, to make, sometimes make mistakes, right? If you act fast, you will, you will fail from time to time. And this is pretty much comes with the company culture. So if, if you have a company culture where you can, where you're allowed to try things and also to fail, then you're much, much, uh, uh, it's much more likely that you will speed up faster, right? And I think right now at this point in time, it's, it's pretty crucial that, that um, people start to act faster. Thank you. Um, we want to like open up the topic a little bit more uh, and want to go into the topic of ecosystems a little bit deeper. Um, Miriam, is there is there any trend you can see in the development of ecosystems? I do see lots of trends there, but first of all, I would like to add something to what um, sure. to your discussion because um, I also talk um, 
sometimes to corporates and people from the Mittelstand. Um, and I think what startups often do not see is why they, the corporates actually are that slow. Um, and for example, there is lots of regulation they are facing that startups don't face already or don't see already, or maybe they will see that only after a year or so. Mm -hmm. um, but corporates do see that, and there are reasons for that, I think. We need, um, for example, we talked about um, producing trains, we need safety there. And I think these are issues that startups maybe tend to forget, and then... Or ignore. But you also have to keep that in mind, and probably you will have it in mind when you are 10 years old or so, and um, you are facing these regulations um, too, or more of them. She's protecting me, can you see that? <laughs> I see that, I see that. I, I, um, <laughs> do, you, do you wish for a startup tour the other way around? I don't know how many corporates are already like walk through your office and, and, and visit you and wanted to know, or get you to know a little bit better. Um, would you wish for a startup tour with, with, in which you can like uh, tour around the corporates and get a little bit more uh, knowledge about their processes and all those things? I think that they're, they're doing a good job in, in explaining what they do, and also I think for most of the, in, in most of the meetings from right from the beginning, the kind of overlap is pretty obvious. For, at least for our case, it, it's pretty easy to see how how we can get together. But then usually um, you have to. Uh, in, in many, many companies, so in Germany, at least that's my experience from larger co corporates, and that's all not true for small and medium sized enterprises. Mm -hmm. I will exclude mm -hmm. them here. Is um, that, um, of course, you have like always like 15, 20 people being part of the decision making. You have to find a meeting where everyone mm -hmm. can attend, stuff like this. And this, this kind of bureaucratic process consumes the most, most of the yeah. time then. Yeah. Because I think in, in many companies, people are afraid. To, to make a decision which they get blamed afterwards for, and that's why they try to in, get, get the insurance that everyone is basically in the boat. Mm -hmm. Can I? But can I have I? also seen a lot of startups actually growing up, um, becoming huge companies with 10,000 employees or so, and they are facing kind of the same problems mm -hmm. then in the end. I think, you know, it's, it's, it's definitely not about uh, finger pointing, saying we're the fast one, you're the slow one. I, I, positively speaking, I think um, both sides need, need each other. Um, and um, in order to facilitate and make that collaboration working, I think my recommendation for the corporate side would be, you know, first of all, understand this, the situation to start us in. And secondly, ideally, in case you really want to work with a, with, a, with a company and a startup and really want to build a you know, customer relationship, then have a project leader who is empowered to basically help the startup fight through the organization. Mm -hmm. It's a bit like you're with a machete going through the rainforest and, and the startup cannot do it on, on its own and any institution that helps the startups positive. So to mention one positive example, for example, BMW Startup Garage is all about that. Um, um, uh, it's not about investing or so, it's really about um, getting into a modus operandi with BMW. And I think uh, we need more of these positive examples. Yeah. And on the other hand, you asked about the ecosystem. Yes. Um, when I started covering the startup scene back in 2013, um, I think it was completely different from now. There were um, most of the startups came from Rocket Internet, or at least the ones I was writing about, um, and they were doing basically e-commerce. And um, this developed so fast. Also, um, the amount of money back then, um, I think it was maybe a billion euros or so coming into the um, German ecosystem, and now we have 4.6 billion euros, I think, in 2018. Um, this is rising so fast, and also the collaboration. Um, I think every DAX company nowadays has an accelerator, an incubator, and not everything of this works, but I think this is also a thing of startups. They, they try, they try, they fail, they do it differently, um, but they all um, understood that they have to do something, and I think this is a very um, uh, good thing happening. Yeah. By the way, innovation always means that you fail, right? I mean, totally independent whether you're a startup company or whether you're a large organization. I mean, 90% of the ideas that you have don't, don't get through, don't become truth because they fail. And the point is only like, would you speak about it? Do you take it as a normal part of the process? And, and I think that's the same for, for every, I mean, it wouldn't be an invention, it wouldn't be innovation if you knew already how it would work, right? I mean, mm -hmm. that's exactly. the definition so the, of the world. So the, the, the innovation culture kind of changes? Probably, and uh, what does that do to the to the company culture as well? So, what about the working processes? What about the um, the 
the way you work together in your team. So ex especially in the in the big corporates, I think there's a lot going on when we talk about uh, digital transformation and what that means for the people. So not only in technology-wise, but what's with the human aspect? If I may start, um, the thing is, and Jens Philipp said it, it's, it's all about people. Mm -hmm. And I think when you look at large organization and when you look at traditional ways of how baby boomers and Gen X people usually manage organization, then we come from a tradition of being very hierarchical, right? Like standardized processes, control, KPIs, and everything is actually going to measure. But now with a lot of digitization and you know, innovation happening much more faster, you can't control everything. I mean, you, you didn't, you couldn't control 20 years ago, but people were believing that they could. And I think that's actually changing. So we are trying to set up different teams, as um, Jens Philipp said already, um, you know, like having niches where you let people do whatever they want to do, and mm -hmm. then others where you, have full, you need full control. I mean, Miriam said is like, if you want to travel on a train, you want to be safe at the first place, right? And then you want to be punctual. But I mean, I don't think that you want to go on, a, on an underground where maybe we said, well, we tested it and we have no idea whether it works. You want to be sure that you survive that train ride, right? Sure. Sure. So you have a different like framework uh, in that you in that you have to work. Uh, let's step into uh, another topic that's very important when we talk about the the digitization in Germany. It's about talent. So can ecosystems help by attracting talents, Miriam? Maybe you can give us uh, an answer to that. So we see at the Digital Hub Initiative, you have those 12 hubs, uh, very vivid. Uh, ecosystems, is this something that um, attracts young and digital talents? Um, I think actually that corporates and startups have in common that there is a, um, quite a shortage of talent, talent at the moment and that they um, actually need uh, the same talent in, in both, so um, they are kind of competing mm -hmm. um, for the talent now. Um, what I would like to add is what I think what is very important is to um, to use um, the potential at the universities. Um, in the um, the people doing the research and um, founding companies out of that. I think there is lots of potential in Germany still to um, put more money in that, um, which is, I think, a problem with yep. the um, VC logic of investing um, and the um, technique uh, or the cycles of, of uh, technology developing. Um, yeah, I think there is lots of potential for both startups and corporates um, to use these talents coming out of that. What are you doing to attract talents in your companies? I, I think there are different ways. Janina, yeah, Christian? It depends on where we are and it depends what you what you understand as talent. I mm -hmm. mean, just like to, to remember, I mean, of course, everyone looks for data and IT people, whatever, but we also, for example, desperately look for welders. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, or, or for good mechanical people. So, so I think the talent defines a little bit like, and what's your business scope? Mm -hmm. And whom do you look for? And, and I think then also location. We, for example, when we build up our predictive maintenance for our mobility services, we had two locations where we built locomotives. Um, one is in Munich, and the other one is in the middle of nowhere. I mean, those know in Germany, it's Braunschweig. And so um, there was a tendency from our engineers to do it in Braunschweig because we, we have a certain, certain structure there. But we couldn't get people to Braunschweig. I mean, you know, maybe not even Germans would go there. I mean, mm. sorry. <laughs> I mean, so I, mean, I don't want to, I mean, but there is other locations as well. But, you know, and if you, want to, if you want to attract international talent, then pretty much like the only German city is Berlin. And then afterwards, already Munich is a compromise for them. Mm -hmm. And so I think that's what you have to take into consideration, that on a scale for the global talent, we need to be thinking about, like, where is Germany really attractive and what do we need to do? And that's not only about the pure job. It's also about the society, what people read about Germany and what they think about Germany. And I think that also plays a role. So what you always have to consider is, like, where do you do what? And one of the things that, for example, I'm discussing with the unions always, there is that belief that, for example, in Germany or in, in the US, you find better engineers than maybe in, in, in China. And that is not true at all anymore. So the global talent is so exquisite everywhere that pretty yeah. much you can do it wherever you have the market. And I think that's a huge rethinking for a lot of large corporations. Yeah. Christian, you are in China and in Dresden. How do you manage that? I, I think it's location in, in your case. He, he showed us pictures of uh, his office um, backstage. Yeah. That was I sent very my convincing. application, but he doesn't want me. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yeah, so, so, so uh, answering the question how we, how we attract talents basically is 
cre creating a company and a place where people like to work. Where, where, so where they, so we have people like um, writing proposals for jobs. Uh, also internationally, China, Egypt, Swiss, Switzerland, also US. But the point is, we we so our headquarters in Dresden, and for us that's basically the perfect place to be. So Dresden is. Of course, it's it, it's not so well known for like startups and also not big corporates, but it, it's actually that. it's actually um, so we have of course one of the best universities in Germany. There are many like um, many Fraunhofer's um, Max Planck Institute. So from technical point of view, the the, the kind of the skill set of the people coming out of universities and, and, and after their PhD is completely comparable to people coming out from MIT, Stanford, whatsoever, right, Shenzhen. So people are really, really, really smart. And of course for us it's, it, it's a plus that the competition for, for those talents is not so big as in Munich or Berlin. And I think that's the only way for us is to, um, also for when we're talking about international talents, Right, we are looking for people that love to work for our company and can contribute from their skill set really to the mm -hmm. to to the stuff we need. And therefore, you you have to create a place where people would like to work. And that, so yes, having a beautiful office is part of the game. But the office we have, you wouldn't you wouldn't be able to pay in Berlin, for example. Yes. They have a very beautiful villa. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Look it up on the web page. Maybe I can disclose that we actually yeah. tried to make them come to Berlin when we invested um, because we felt it would be a more vibrant ecosystem. I think in that particular case and in more and more cases, it was right to them to stay there. And I also see first startups developing, uh, opening development offices in, um, let's say, second or third tier German cities because they are. Yeah, the war for talent is real, and it's not a corporate problem. It's also something that you already experienced at early stage. Um, so yes, going to Berlin it makes no sense for us. So we are industrial startup working mainly B two B, and Berlin basically there are no customers, or almost no customers here. The, the whole ecosystem works on mainly B two C. Uh, Dresden is the biggest uh, site for microelectronics in Europe. Um, also, the, happen, uh, the, the, the smart systems hub in, in Dresden uh, brings together all those players from research, from, from industry, from startups helping us there. But um, maybe, maybe one word, because it's not only critical, of course, Germany is, is, is the best place for us as a, as a deep tech startup to be, because here are all the, all the big companies that help us to grow, to improve our, our technology, to bring it to the world. The, the companies like Siemens, actually. But, um, but of course, I think when we're working, in, especially in Asia, the, the, the pace and speed is completely different. And if we think that having this advantage in technology and engineering and knowledge uh, will help us in the future, if we um, is a false thought, I, I would say, and, and, and speed will be crucial. Yeah. Thank you so far. Uh, what I want to do is to open up the, um, the panel for questions from the audience. Uh, please raise your hand. Hello. Yeah. Hello, my name is Goran. I'm from Code Control. I have actually two comments and would like you to comment on this. Two things, in my opinion, for German's digitization problem is, first of all, you tapped on it, but it's about failure culture. It's, it's really about failure culture, which hinders us in Germany a little bit, and especially in the corporate environment. I've worked 15 years in corporate, uh, also Siemens, and uh, changed to uh, startup scene the last four years, and this is the biggest difference, big difference I see. Um, and the second one is the last topic you just mentioned. We are talking about digitization, and the topics we close is uh, office space. This doesn't come together. Today, if we are talking about wall of talents, we have to open our mind also to remote work, because the talents don't want to come to Dresden, not to Braunschweig, and potentially also not to Berlin. Because today it's important that you can work from everywhere. And if we are talking about digitization, we should use the tools we have as well today, which are digital. And it doesn't matter where you work, we have the tools today to work everywhere. Any so other? Was, it, was it a question or a statement? <laughs> 
I mean, the, the only thing I, I mean, you, I think you're right with both points. The only comment I had with this uh, remote uh, work relationship, yes, that happens. However, we have made the experience at this critical time when a company gets born, basically, it's really valuable to have people all in one place. Uh, I mean, there are some exceptions of companies which started completely decentralized and, 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 and were successes. But the majority of cases actually starts in one room and works day and night. Uh, that's my experience. But later on, I agree with you. So yes, I would also also say you're absolutely right, and we also have this. But it's more challenging. I think at, at least for us, it feels more challenging. I would say than for a company who has well-established processes, procedures for for those kinds of, of, of concepts, who have run basically f through this learning process for quite a while, because. Um, for, for a small company, every every big mistake you make has a, has a bigger imp uh, every mistake you make has a bigger impact. And having people on site helps you to also create kind of a, a spirit where people um, contribute to each other's faults. When it comes to failure, then I think it's like we once a year we always um, have an award for our greatest inventors of the year, and pretty much like 30% of them in their speech always say, "I had." A little bit, I took a part of my budget that I had and I was working on that idea and I was hiding that idea until it actually became so good that I was actually just like, you know, showing it off. And so I think that's what I sometimes tell people is like, do not always ask for permission. Just do it and if it doesn't really work right and you get blamed, then ask for forgiveness, which is usually given because that's the only way that you can actually drive innovation. So that's maybe weird that I'm saying that, but I think I have done that very often um, as well. And sometimes it works out and sometimes you just, you know, whatever, get slapped or whatever. And then anyway, but um, other, the only thing is like, whenever you have a great idea, everyone was contributing to that great idea, but then let's, let's take them apart. Is there a microphone here? Okay. Excuse me, can we get the microphone? Hi, I've got a question to Christian and Jania Kugel. Um, we actually, just yesterday, we sat together with a couple of CDOs from very traditional German SMEs, and we were talking about the importance of startup corporate cooperation. And one of the big issues they've had that kept coming up that they couldn't solve, and we also really couldn't help them with, um, was that they said when it comes to strategic cooperation with startups, it's always a matter of um, they want assurances that if they develop something great together, then that's actually something they own. Mm -hmm. And that's something that is basically a no deal for any kind of startup with any kind of also ambition to cash out maybe in the end, you know, and maybe choose a different path. So I was just wondering, you know, um, Janina, also from your perspective, is that something that you've encountered and how do you deal with that? And Christian, how, um, how do you see that and have you encountered that kind of problem in the past? Yes, I agree. Um, we're learning from that. Um, I think it's, it's a little bit like what well, most probably Jens Philip could actually say. If you want to be part of it, you need to find other ways of like being participating. And I think that's also very clear. And then you have to discuss, is it patents or is it, is it then maybe the, the market or all of that? But again, here, it's you cannot resolve the new ideas with the old methods. And it's like saying, if we do it together, then it's mine. That doesn't really work. Yes, so, so there is the mismatch sometimes, depending on the company, of course, uh, that people claim to be like I innovation managers doing innovation projects. And then they, um, of course, the project, the outcome must be clear. I think return on investment must be tomorrow. And then um, also they must have the super, super insurance that everything works, which is the opposite of innovation then. Mm. But um, the thing is, so when we, of course, that also has to do with how startups present themselves to the corporates, right? So um, if you talk to those companies, of course, what we do is we don't give like a startup pitch. We, we arrive there as some company providing a solution for automation, basically, which helps them to, to get a better feeling on, on how this works. Because they're, I think, with, especially with many small, medium-sized companies um, that come from production for us, they, they have a vacuum hyped feeling on what a startup basically is. So, Maybe one comment. I've been at a very, very large corporate last week, and they said, um, in con so we are not a startup. We don't use those colored stickers we put on walls. We do real business, right? And so, so I think um, I was standing there, didn't know what to say. So, um, but um, of course, the, this, is the, this, is the, this is exactly the point we've talked about. Being brave to 
to sometimes also make a, make a mistake. Of course, the damage of this mistake must be somehow calculated and must be not severe, but people must be able to... Jens. Just just one point to, to add. So I think people completely forget about the most intensive way of working with the startups, actually buying it. So I, I, in this whole discussion, uh, usually it's about you know collaborating on a product development level or buying something or investing. Like and, and then we always look to the Silicon Valley and admire what's going on there. Actually, the most important. Uh, or the, the, you're closing the loop by having a vibrant M&A um, ecosystem um, and actually acquiring the talent and the product and, and continue you know, in-house. Um, even companies like Apple and Google, they're buying many companies. Um, and, and so it's not just happening internally, but externally. And I, I mean, well, it's of course the investor's perspective because we have to, you know, in the end, sell and, and return our fund. Um, but I, I wish, you know, uh, corporates would take a bit more risk also when it comes to M&A um, um, and not wait until it's bought by somebody else from, 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 another, uh, um, from, from another country, but actually also, um, yeah, be a bit bolder when it comes to M&A to, you know, get, and get do, innovation. Do they, do they need to invest in startups even more? So, uh, of course they do. And, 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 and uh, the, uh, um, let's... We are currently still in a situation where every euro is welcome. That's what I would describe it, because it's still underdeveloped, like by factor four to five compared to US. So we're, there's a lack of venture capital and or in general. Um, I, my personal view is a, a corporate should only invest at late stage. They should not engage too much at early stage because it's yeah, it's usually not compatible at this stage. But um, I think they should invest. It, it's one way, but also think of. M&A and acquiring a company 100%. Di diversify the, the portfolio yeah. of the yeah. form of collaboration, format of collaboration with startups or investing in them. Um, Miriam, you, you uh, see the whole ecosystem uh, as a like total working space with all the aspects that we have already uh, talked to about. So talents, collaboration, financing aspects, all those things. Um, what do you think is the most important thing that ha gonna happen in the future that we don't like see maybe not yet, um, but what's what's gonna developing in the next uh, months or years when we talk about the ecosystems? Um, well, what's developing in in terms of um, technologies? I think I would be on Philip's side um, if I knew that. Um, but what I see, what is the most important thing, I think, is work closer together for corporates and startups. We um, now heard about all these little problems, um, and I think we can only solve them if we go on working together and try and fail and um, do better. I think this is going to, um, to be an intense, but in the end, um, productive way. Um, and what I said before, um, what I think is necessary is... Um, to um, to focus on this uh, research transfer mm -hmm. because there I think is huge potential in Germany still um, compared to China and the US um, we have great universities we have great researchers but we are not really able to transform that into big companies I mean we have a lot of small companies coming out of that doing small things um, doing great things but small things, but um, we don't have these huge platforms that are um, defining the standards. Mm -hmm. And we should have to work on that if we um, want to set the standards for this um, industrial digitization in the future. Thank you. I think there was one more question. Yeah, here's the $1 billion question to Daniel Kugel. Whether, yeah, corporate cultural change, at least in the medium term, let's say three to five years, do you think it's possible? Uh, <laughs> I mean, we were also discussing that behind stage because Christian said to me is you are so different than anyone else at Siemens and then I said it's like and he said it's a compliment right so I'm taking that and I believe we are changing if I'm thinking back of what I experienced 10 or 15 years back then I think we do definitely change now we are 380,000 people right you're not changing them within a year all of like that and you need different people diversity is also to have different things but I do think you can but I think you have to push for it and you have to live it from the top and you have to allow it. And that's usually a huge effort because I always like say if people change their behavior, they have to unlearn behavior. And that's always the worst and the most difficult thing to unlearn things and especially to unlearn things if you know that a special behavior made you successful for many years. Mm -hmm. 
And that's what usually, you know, a startup has, doesn't really have that history. I mean, they come together and they start a company and they don't really have that history of like, what made you successful? Corporations like us, we, we have that. And I think that's the tricky part. But yeah, we do change. Yes, I think so. Everything can can be achieved with enough will and resources, right? So, but um, yes, we, we 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 do need each other quite as quite well. So I think, um, and and in Germany we have this huge benefit of of uh, having really stable big uh, companies having doing awesome products, and um, I think this um, you need the right people driving that change, right? So. But Carly, there's one question that we were discussing like two days ago. We met maybe those of you following the German press, they have heard about the Digitalrat. We were meeting together and thinking like what made other com countries more successful? And as we are also, you know, sponsoring here by the yeah. Federal Minister of Economic Affairs, I think when you look at parts of San Francisco, parts of the Silicon Valley, or when you look, for example, at Shenzhen, they were special areas where pretty much like it was requested that an ecosystem would actually grow under different... Um, you know, tax systems and all of that, they had much more freedom than anything, anyone else around it. And I think when you look at it, like 10, 15 years later, that really came to what, what you can see now. And if I'm looking at Germany, that's not what we have in big style, right? I mean, attracting ecosystems, like Miriam said, also means that you have to create the circumstances and the environment to actually do that. And I think that's a gaby, maybe again, a little bit of like the not risk-taking um, approach of Germans, like being a little bit more, what should I say, um, risk averse, but I think that could actually leverage quite a lot. Yeah. Is there any more question? Yeah. Did you actually notice that it's only gentlemen asking questions, <laughs> ladies? <laughs> Just as a comment and a hint. <laughs> Just coming back to your comment about like um, making Berlin and Munich more attractive for new people, I think that uh, the problem is pretty much more about investment. Um, I believe, for, for example, that we understand innovation and digitalization in Germany as just efficiency-driven and sustainable-driven innovation. And what I mean is, for example, if you go to a car manufacturer, uh, they talk a lot about like predictive maintenance at uh, Siemens as well, so we are actually just increasing um, efficiency. And if you see as well in the startup um, uh, world, you're trying to solve that kind of problems and actually hope that some kind of enterprises are going to acquire you and or you are going to get customers out of them. So I believe that our vision is actually very small in that kind of view, even as well with venture capital because uh, the investment, actually the return on investment is expected to be very, very at middle term. So the difference that I see, I've been as well a couple of times as well in Silicon Valley or London and as well here in Germany, and the biggest difference is the way how we approach actually technology um, and we are, how we approach innovation. So we don't, I don't see anything here like very much when I'm talking to people, how we approaching actually problems that we don't know how to solve. And we are not putting money out of it. For example, last time as well, I was as well on the other side. Uh, if you hear about Elon Musk, Jeff Bezos, they are talking about artificial intelligence in other ways we are talking about. So we are talking about like in different industries, we can use computer vision to be more efficient. But if you hear the Americans, they are saying, you know what, deep learning is inefficient because you need a lot of data. How we can do that actually more efficient? And that's where I see the role of the, actually the federal ministry, uh, also the, the, the Bundesregierung, the, uh, the federal um, government, and as well from venture capital to try to solve that kind of problem. So to think in kind of stuff that is a long-term uh, game, and that's actually how it's going to affect the, the economy in a positive way. Because if we are just working in uh, efficient, efficiency-driven <laughs> innovation, we're going to get to a point where we're going to generate capital but we are going to be cutting off jobs. And we need to think in a way as well how we can create jobs again. And I believe that we are very bad at that. So trying to use this panel just to hear what is your opinion about that, about this uh, thinking about in the long term, uh, just putting money, uh, as well going to the media, just my last comment. Um, I'm always kind of like just get, um, it's kind of funny sometimes when you see how we criticize companies like Airbnb or Uber because uh, they are burning cash 
like 400 million every quarter, but they are doing that because they have another kind of like global vision and they just want to change the market, but we haven't understand that. All right. I mean, I, 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 I agree and don't agree. So uh, it's um, uh, from a venture capital perspective, I mean, we are very much aware that you get great returns, which we in the end work for, by having, um, you know, big hits. There's, uh, there's nothing like a safe bet in venture capital, meaning like, you know, the, the safe, small German startup, which, I don't know, gets to 10 million revenues, and then, but on a safe path. It, this doesn't exist. So we aim for the, for the, for the, for the, for the long I mean, we're in for the long run, and we aim for the, for the big shots. Um, but however, I mean, again, you know, this comparison between the European or Berlin ecosystem with Silicon Valley always comes up. In the end, it's really about the, uh, the, the number of shoots on the target. I mean, if we have five times less venture capital here, uh, then it's simply five times more likely that the next Amazon or Google or whatever, Alibaba, will emerge in another jurisdiction, but not here. Um, so, of course, it's partially about the mindset, but I think the mindset of entrepreneurs have changed. So people are not just building the, you know, the German Salando anymore, but they, they really understand that they can also build global businesses out of, out of, out of Germany. Um, but it's again, you need a lot of financial resources and uh, you know investors that are willing to take risks at all the steps to 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 make this happen. And um, um, things are improving, so um, that's the good news. Like the number uh, or the total euros invested is rising every year. But in relationship to China and US, we are far 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 behind. Um, So yes, we also want to build a very big company and aiming for the long run. We're not burning 400 million quarterly yet. <laughs> um, however, I would say in addition to that, I think what needs to change in Germany from my perspective, coming, so I, I worked in research doing also lecturing for, for seven years. Um, you, what needs to be changed is the mindset of, of people when it comes to entrepreneurial thinking, right? Um, having this, this, this immediate um, kind of reflex when you see a good idea to think about how could I build a company around that? Can I, can I, can I make this technology work in a broader scale, right? People here are raised with a mindset that it's risky, it's, uh, it, you might fail, stuff like this. But, um, and, and I think from, from, from school to university, this entrepreneurial thinking in the whole society must be empowered in order to, to really um, thank people for, for, for striving for those ideas, even do they fail. But now we've been bashing so much on Germany. I, I think it's like one of the things that I also want to say is there's many good things. If we use them and if we are a little bit more faster, then I think we're also having a, I mean, to your comment about like, you know, you're taking the Googles and the Amazon and, and for example, kind of like, you know, making jokes about predictive maintenance. But I think it's like what well, we are exceptionally good as, as, a, in, as a country is like having really a lot of understanding about engineering and mechanical things, right? Which is a lot of engineering work in there. You're not inventing, for example, a new turbine, a new generation within one year. You need like three years of research to actually, you know, improve efficiency, all of it. And if you can connect, I mean, pretty much like IoT, if you bring those words together, I think Germany is very well positioned. Everything that we said and everything that I would personally criticize as well, if we make that happen, and if we become that speed in there, then I think that would be tremendous. On the other hand, I also say if we complain even more and discuss even longer, then of course, I mean, others will actually overtake. And there I also see tendencies, especially when I go to China, every six months I'm thinking, oh my God, and again, this is so fast and so different than what I saw just recently. I also think, um, though I'm from the media and the media is always criticizing, um, <laughs> I also think it's not that useful maybe um, to create this anxiety like China will kill us and the US already killed us um, because anxiety is probably not a good motor for innovation but we should maybe more look on the fun sides of innovation and um, yeah that's yeah, no, that I, but I think all, all pretty much all that were said was, was not real criticism like we're so bad. It was pretty much constructive criticism, kind of um, shaping a road how to improve, right? So of course, if we stand here and, and say, okay, Germany is a great place, go on, then of course we will not improve. This, 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 in this kind of situation, we, that's the chance to, to really pinpoint the, the things where we need to improve in order to still keep our position.
But, but Miriam, I think it's like, as you're an editor and a journalist, I think we can need more of that positive energy because I've worked in the US as well and everything is always great and always is always fantastic. And, you know, I mean, sometimes it gets on my nerves as well. But on the other hand, I also like that. And I think if we get in there with more optimism and skepticism, that doesn't mean that you do not have to consider the complexity. But a little bit more optimism, I think, sometimes could be good. Yeah, that's... Yeah, I mean, for every one of us, and we're all exactly. playing a role. But you have to write about it. <laughs> thank thank you very much for the, for the last comment. This was, like, really discussing here on the, on the stage now. Uh, one last question, and then... Uh, there's the, yeah. Please give the microphone to the lady. Yes, please. There are two ladies. There are I know I'm biased, <laughs> consciously. There, there are two ladies. Maybe we can get both. So here's ah. one lady. <laughs> Positive discrimination, yeah, right? Sorry for all the men now. So, um, <laughs> I also work for a big corporate. And I wanted to know, as we discussed a lot about startups and uh, corporates, how can they? or should they work together? I was part of a startup initiative last year where we put together a very diverse team in order to f maybe found a startup idea. In our case, we found one. But I would like, and there were challenges, yeah, how to bring that idea into the corporate uh, still. So I would like to ask you, what are your opinions about um, founding startups within a corporate? Uh, that's... It's difficult, and I think you were describing it, but I think there is also half chances. And again, I mean, you must think that we're standing behind stage for hours, but one of the things that I say, typical, typical thing that, I am, that I'm experiencing is people want to have a startup, but they want to have the safety of a corporate. Okay, so they come up with, we do crowdfunding, hackathons, and all of the things. Then they get a crowdfunding, they get an idea, they work on it for three months. And then pretty much like, it comes maybe the point where even he would come in and say, okay, we're investing. And then we say, okay, we have to pretty much like, you know, build an own organization. And then our people very often say, yeah, but I still want to have my, my share um, package. I still want to have my salary every 12 months and all of it. And you can't have it both. So either you take the life of a corporate with all of the goods and the bad things, or you go and take the life of a startup with all of the goods and the bads, but you cannot have, I mean, you know, I wish I could do my job in 25 hours a week or in 40. That would be fabulous and that's not realistic. So I think that's very often what we struggle, but then I can also tell you there's more and more people that go and do it and try. And by the way, I always like to say, if you're good, everyone wants you back. Yeah. Okay, if you leave the organization and you want to come back and we were sorry about losing you, we will always take you back. And if we don't take you back, someone else will take you back. And I think that's a part of it. But besides, there's many other things, but I think the dynamics in certain phases of a business is different ones. As Philip said, we should most probably only go for more, uh, more mature, mature yeah. business. I think that's what the difference is also. I mean, you're always free to quit your job and start a company and, you know, get funding from someone else. I mean, that's, I mean, and then for us, it's the main criteria. It's, I mean, the, everybody looks for this one idea. Actually, the idea is not too valuable because it's, it's all about the execution. And the, again, the execution is linked to this energy that you bring as an entrepreneur to really succeed and overcome all these obstacles. I think Christian will, will definitely know what I mean. Um, and in case you really feel that, you know, that, that energy inside you, you know, somebody really has to bring this product to market, then um, I think, you know, in a positively speaking, um, much imp improved venture capital environment, you will probably also find funding. So, I mean, I know it's uh, the, the, the rocky path um, to, to leave a corporate, but it's always an option. One comment, uh, okay. one last. The thing is only, I have a lot of friends working in startups and they went bankrupt so often, right? And they didn't get paid so often. And the one thing is like, I always think, we always tell on the positive side of the one thing. And I think they could tell a story like for ages of like how much it needs to actually get the funding and to get the funding again after 12 months and after 18 months. And that is very often totally underestimated by people that have been working in corporate for a long time. Yeah. And successfully creating a startup which works is only <laughs> like I would say 50% technology and the rest really is, is learning, building up structures, building up a, a business model, creating a really creating a company from the business side and and this um, and you have to learn a lot you have to struggle a lot you have sleepless nights and I think you have to have this pressure of, of putting everything go fully in otherwise you will not you will lose those 10% you need in order to make it successful 
I think we could like, go on and on with all the questions uh, from, from you guys and, and here on the stage uh, discussing. We, we tapped into so many fields uh, in this, like, not, not even an hour, uh, from talents about like, cooperation between startups and, uh, and, and corporates and how they can work together a little bit better. Uh, what, about, what does that do to the culture of a corporate and of a startup too? Um, And, uh, and I, I remembered what Miriam said, we have to look on the fun side. Actually, it's not only the fun side, it is the positive side. And that's, I think, uh, what uh, came across on this, on this stage today, that uh, we don't have always to look very pessimistic or negative on the topic digitization of the key industries. Um, there's always very inspiring people that are working on that and that will bring that topic forward. I thank you very much for those inspiring guests today.